so it's it's not too often that you go back in and put back the dirt that you took out. is all designed for pretty great wind loads. The sheets of glass are just big sheets of plate glass, which are butted right into the concrete. These things were, were windows that, that weighed a ton. We're using a hydro crane that has suction cups holding the machine to the, to the glass. The uh, crane operator has to put this glass in just right. There's no room to move it around because of the concrete being so hard that we could break the glass. Copper piping. Why copper? Then call for it in the specs. That's the cleaning process with emery cloth. Now I'm doing the fitting, preparing for uh, for the solder joint. process of soldering that joint now that I just prepared. In the heating process, that melts your solder, which is drawn into the pores of that copper to bond, make the bond. The heat is the process which draws it in there. sure that you have a, a raceway, an open pipe through there. We're using a pole wire that we shove into the conduits from one end to the other. And then we tie on the wires. 
taping them to eliminate obstructions. Then it's just a matter of pulling it on one end where the man is feeding the wire into the conduit from the other end. And these wires are electrical wires for the feeding the electricity to the different areas of the house. Pulled through plastic pipes that have been formed and bent and completely encased in concrete so they're completely concealed. There was a very big fire hazard out there. Uh, it's dry, it has burned over, it'll burn over in the future. So everything on the exterior is concrete or glass or brick, that's it. I mean, nothing can burn. This bricklayer is, uh, he's laying the brick. He's trying to do a neat job. This white stuff that you see going on in the brick is a, it's a masonry glue. We didn't want to expose any mortar in these joints, so we just uh, glued them together. It's a lot harder that way, because you just have to uh, just get them all straight to begin with. That's why you see them leveling almost every brick. So that was the concept, utilizing that freeway type construction to tune in on something which is really one of the great structural wonders of the world, you know, which is the freeway system. This is something where, you know, billions of dollars has been spent in a transportation system. A whole technology has been developed out of that. So all we're telling the concrete contractor is to do what has been done on freeway bridges and retaining walls. ceiling to the lower floor, and, and that's all planted in lawn. The way that it was put into the terrain, uh, you know, even knowing where it is, I have to look quite hard to find that place.
Anybody got any questions? It's a forced air, uh, heating and air conditioning. Gas fired. Yeah, um, actually the, the walls are about 10 inches thick and it acts like adobe. The sun on it in the daytime warms it and that heat goes in at night and by the time morning comes it's cooled off and it stays cool during the day. So it works on that same kind of a cyclical principle. Right. Um, the house contains about 7,000 square feet. About 1,000 of it is in the dark room and uh, uh, screening room areas. Uh, and the house, you got to remember, the house is really a prototype. Um, I considered it as a prototype for a village in the hills, something like that. So when you think of square foot costs, I think you really have to equate it to what it would be if that was a larger project. But it essentially cost about $75 a square foot. Right. It had to go through that hose. It had to go through the pump. In other words, it had to be wet enough to flow f freely through the pump hose. Is that what you're asking me? They had to make a wetter mixture than they wanted to to get it through the hose. Um, they would have preferred to have a drier mixture, right? Yes. Uh, I noticed in one of the later uh, shots there that you had uh, some big cracks. Is that the dining room floor? Right. How did you handle that? Well, what happened was that uh, during the landscaping phase, um, outside that piece of glass, a sprinkler head got buried. And every time they turn on the sprinklers, why all that water would run down and it worked its way underneath before anybody discovered it and the floor started coming up. We had known that we had an expansive soil situation, so what we did was we put six inches of sand underneath all the slabs, assuming that the water pressure that came up would be absorbed into the sand and wouldn't push the slab up. But in this case, it was so great that it pushed the slab up. The only way to resolve that was that we put a gray carpet down. And actually, when we, uh, when the clients agreed to accept a concrete house of this type, we knew that we were probably going to have some pretty severe acoustical problems, and we decided that the first place that we would start examining that problem would be on the floor, and that we would probably wind up putting some carpet in. And I think if you, do you remember in the slide photographs, it was, it was carpeted, I believe, or some of it was carpeted. More of it is carpeted now because they just started getting very, very annoyed at the hard sound that they were getting. So that's how we solved the problem. We used a, a gray wool commercial carpet that really looks quite nice. You had to keep the cement on the cracks. Well, we tried to repair the crack. I tried to repair it myself, and I made it worse. So uh, I got in there with some Elmer's glue that I mixed uh, cement in with, you know, and tried to get it down in there, but it didn't work. Right. Well, there we decided to go to a very traditional kind of roofing. Monoform roofing was available, but I was really kind of scared of it because I felt that if we got any leaks through there, it would really be disastrous. And so we went to a five-ply built-up roof. And where it comes to the concrete parapets, it turns up into a little reveal and then we poured a concrete curb against that. And then across the top of it, we put a concrete inch and a half of cement topping before we put the soil on because we were afraid that the fertilizers would eat up the roofing material. So it's all sealed with a cement topping, too. Right.
i felt i'm glad you asked that question because i felt i was skipping over something there and i couldn't remember what it was i felt that those cylinders and cubes really related in a very important way to those cliffs in other words the cliffs were really strong forms and there was no possible way that any kind of sort of abstract shapes or whatever were going to overpower them or do anything at all with them and i felt that these simple cylinders and cubes would would harmonize with those stronger shapes i really wanted that house to be subservient to the site and i felt that staying within a very simple pure geometry was the best way to do it does that answer that for you Yeah, but I don't think that the forms are that diverse because fundamentally, if you we'd have to go back to the slides, but if you look at those cliffs, you see lots of horizontal strata running through them. You see strong verticals and you see strong horizontals, and you see some pretty simple shapes, even though they're not uh, you know refined geometric shapes. So I felt that there was a definite relation there. Yeah, I was playing a game, undoubtedly, because I told you that I took it out of the site to draw it. I found that the site was so overpowering that I couldn't even really design it uh, under those circumstances. So I took it out, and then I made those drawings that I showed you one elevation of, I think, and then I put it back in again and uh, approached it that way. Right. Yeah, uh, their, their fundamental objection to the project was that it was going to be new construction in the area and that with the controls the way they were and the control that those people had, that that was going to be the beginning of the end. And in that sense, I tended to agree with them that if the Coastal, the Coastal Commission simply told me when they passed the building, they said we were looking at this very carefully because if we pass this at three stories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that's what's going to happen through that area. And uh, we want to make sure that it's, that it's appropriate. Well, they did pass it. And the people in the area took that as meaning that that was what they were going to approve in general. And the more I thought about it, uh, the more I could see their point that it might be very destructive to have that kind of thing proliferating all through that area. Now, I... I don't want to sound like I'm putting myself down and doing that because I believed in the project very strongly and I was very disappointed when it didn't get approved. But I was able to get my head around to where I could see their point of view very clearly. Right. Well, I, uh, you know, simply discovered that this was the area that I was going to get work in. And I simply had to accept that fact. Uh, that's why I started out by saying that I didn't consider myself to be at the cutting edge, you know, or where it's all at or anything else. I'm simply doing what I was fortunate enough, enough to get. I, I, s I don't think that we have that much control over our destinies unless we're really, you know, much more fantastic people than I am. And I simply tried to do the best I could with what I was able to get. Uh, the, the change in tempo from the big house in Santa Barbara to the little one in Venice was a reaction to that big a house and that big a project for three people. I mean, I really felt that it was uh, 
it was okay as a prototype, you know, if we accepted the use of freeway construction as maybe, and this house, maybe if you put the freeway system and this house together, you would have enough information if you wanted to build a, a village, you know, in Carpinteria or something like that. Uh, but beyond that point, I didn't see much relevance to it, and the more I studied the problem, the less I liked the idea of building in the hills at all. So by the time the project was finished, I decided that it was insane to keep building in the Santa Monica Mountains, and I felt that what we should do is go back into urban areas, uh, either do what you're doing with your place, you're in the Gill place, right? Uh, or uh, build inexpensively from scratch, <laughs> or build uh, inexpensively, you know, shoebox type architecture. And I think the only mistake that we made uh, essentially was in going into the canal area. We had a very sensitive area, uh, and I wish that we had have gone into the Palms area or Culver City or. See, the way I envision that kind of thing being relevant is that if you went into areas where there were lots of dilapidated houses, you could simply take out the dilapidated ones, replace them with that kind of housing, which I feel gives the owner a great deal of flexibility. You know, I mean, how many, if you walk around Venice at night, how many houses do you see all the action going on in the garage, you know, where the people are working on their boat or their hobby or whatever, you know, and this was simply an effort to uh, take a look at an evolving society where couples are more and more, you know, doing things at home, actively involved in work or hobbies or whatever, and provide them with a place to do it for the least amount of money possible. So that was where I saw the relevance of it. But we just hit the, hit a really tough area on it, because the canal area is a very sensitive area right now. That's exactly right, right. Yeah, I, we missed two slides at the beginning of my presentation, unfortunately. One of them was a, was a painting because I wanted to explain the fact that the last three months I've been totally involved in painting, uh, which I can just say, that's fine. The other slide was a slide of my office, which is a storefront on Lincoln, which uh, is where Jack Brogan made all the uh, easy edges, cardboard furniture, you know. And it's 2,400 square feet with a 17-foot high ceiling. And uh, we live there, and I have my office there, and I spent about $1,500 making it livable by putting in a kitchen and bathtub and all of that kind of stuff, and had a fantastic time. That's how I spent another three months, was actually building that. So the last six months I've been involved in painting and building that space, which were two really interesting experiences for me, which I wanted to mention, but those two slides got dropped out for some reason or another. Yeah, right. Well, that's a that's a, uh, a good question. I mean, I have to answer it from two standpoints. The first standpoint is that some of the forms and things go way, way back in my thinking for maybe, uh, you know, I could look at sketches that I did maybe 15, 20 years ago that that echo some of the forms that were evolved in that house. Uh, but beyond that, there was also the aspect of it, in my mind, truly being a prototype in the sense that I really did feel that it was worthwhile to revive the concrete technology that, that was really very prevalent in Southern California in the 20s and 30s. You know, you drive around the city and look at the number of fantastic concrete churches, for example, poured in place, concrete churches, and you see there was a whole fabulous technology in the building industry here, which then made the freeway thing work, and now could 
possibly come back into architecture again. Right. Well, the impact of moving into anything like that is, is very, very strong. And that house has had a fantastic effect upon them, even though they were really quite prepared through models and what have you. And obviously, Jesse's making the film as we were going along. I mean, they were there every day, you know, watching it take place. But when they moved in, they were very shocked. And, uh, Right, and this shock is just beginning to kind of wear off, I think. They're just beginning to uh, to really like it, although they are still not quite sure. It's a very strong dose for them to accept because they discovered that even though uh, they're willing to say, well, we really had a lot to do with the way this looks, uh, they know, on the other hand, that they're living with something that I really shaped to a great extent for them. And that really is hard for them to accept. It's not nearly as, I mean, that's another reason that I wanted to do that little project in Venice, because I wanted to see how anonymous one could get, you know, after being that uh, bold, so to speak, in forming somebody else's environment for them. So they're having a hard time, but they're, they're getting into it, I think, now. Right. You have to remember that I'm that I was born here, and I grew up in Southern California. So what I grew up with was um, what was happening in contemporary architecture when I was a kid, going through high school and so on, was Neutra and Schindler and very light frame stuff, and then into post and beam and all that. And when I went to the East and when I went to Europe, I, I received very strong uh, input from the architecture that I saw. So I think this is a response of a Western California guy to a lot of stuff that I saw elsewhere and bringing it here. It never really bothers me that a 10-inch concrete wall could support a 50-story building uh, any more than when I look at the walls around Carcassonne, they're 20 feet thick. I say, you know, what do you need 20 feet for? Uh, to me, it's a kind of a poetic license that I take. Structure has never been that important to me in terms of making everything exactly as thick as it ought to be. Or like a person like Ray, for example, it's very structurally oriented where when you look at one of his houses, you see bang, 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 columns, then you read beams, then you read, you know. I've always uh, approached it as a much more amorphous kind of a thing where walls are simply 